again and fantastically early. Low tide is in two hours. So if you have a look at the water at the moment, there's the wall, there's the water. I'm in the area where there is no digging. There are a few areas like this on the Thames, so I haven't brought my trowel with me. No digging, no scraping, no disturbing of the surface um, other than to pick up whatever I find. So with that said, let's see what's down there. today is this bottle, top of a bottleneck. This late 17th to early 18th century bottle fragment would once have contained wine and most likely would have been in the mallet or onion style. It is hand blown as you can tell by its irregular shape and small bubbles in the glass itself. This section of the bottle is the very top of the neck and it has a lip and collar finish. This bottle would have tapered up to the neck and collar and cork, wire, wax and maybe even cloth would have sealed it closed. Like these bottles here, dating from 1670 to 1690, recently auctioned by Christie's in London. This bottle would likely have had an applied seal on its neck or shoulder. Bottle seals provided information regarding the owner of the bottle such as an embossed symbol, initials or name, and often included a date. The reason for this was that in 1636, English law prohibited the sale of wine by the bottle. To navigate this law, individuals had private bottles made carrying their own seals, which they took to a wine merchant who filled them directly from the cask. Bottle seals are sometimes found on the foreshore in their intact state. Their shape and the fact that they are applied to the bottle helps to maintain their integrity even when broken away from the bottle itself, left to tumble around in the Thames for hundreds of years. Now today I'm going to be looking for some worked bone, so we're going to keep our eyes out for that. It's a lovely sunny day which can be great but it doesn't necessarily mean things are easier to spot. I do like to have a little bit of an overcast shadow going on. So this area lots of pipe fragments, good sign, lots of terracotta, you can see the tide's picking up a bit here going to just rush in for a minute. Oh, and what's that? I can see peeping out a tiny piece of blue pearlware. I think we can leave that here. Oh, this is a nice little piece. That star on there, that's hand painted. That's a keeper. What a feeling it might be a bit of a pottery day. There we go. Tin glaze. Beautiful stuff. The glaze has enamel and tin in it, so it, it produces this lovely icing-like glaze, but it's also very fragile and can crack easily and wears off. But I do love these pieces. I tend to keep them. I just wanted to show you the vast amounts of oyster shells we get down here. Now these date from Roman times onwards. The time was where oysters were in great abundance in London and people used to have them for breakfast. They were a penny an oyster and they would uh, eat them as the first meal of the day. They were so cheap, you can get them from carts stalls. Here you go, one of the Thames mysteries, or the archaeological site of the, of, of the UK, and maybe the world's mysteries. There is no definitive answer to why these oysters have these man-made holes in them. I've done a bit about them before in another video, so check that out. To match my other little star, check out this baby. There we go, teeny tiny, 
so sweet. And I haven't been over to this area since I found a William III penny uh, over here about three years ago, four years ago, I think. So let's see what we can find on the return visit. Be a nice surprise. This penny that I found then was just sticking up out of the ground. You can see how the foreshore is changing here. So some metals coming into play. Some nails. So you can see now this is the area where things might turn up. And I'm looking for very round shapes or very straight shapes. This, I thought with a bit of luck it would be a Roman hairpin, but actually it's an incredibly straight bone. That can't be right, can it? It looks like a stork's leg or something. Just down here and some letterpress. It's the pins that I'm interested in. One fairly new, as in 19th century. And then the other, that well, could be from any date, but look, it's really lovely and chunky. And you can see where they draw the wire and it would be wrapped around to make this head here. In my last video, a few of you asked how I know about pins. I've put up some links. I'll do that again on here. I'll put it in the body of the text um, on this video. So uh, just look for the links there. Just noticed something down here. Part of a dress hook. But the curse of the artifact continues. That is to say, this is incomplete. Part of an artifact. The tide's not going to go particularly low today. At the moment, it's the night tides which are really low. And I'm not really a fan of night larking. I find it too concentrated in one spot. You can't just suddenly dart off because you've peeked something out of the corner of your eye, which is what tends to happen to me. I'll be looking on one spot and I'll notice something in my peripheral vision and dart off. Try and get it in the sun. A big piece of shell. Flat. What gives? What do we think this is? Was it attached or is that just its natural state? Interesting. So I'm waiting for this tide to go down and I wanted to show you here when the water clears you can make out all the many fragments of tide. And I'm looking for anything interesting here. chunky piece of salt glaze. Always worth taking a look just in case you strike it lucky, find a face on it. A face. I think it's Surrey Borderware. I'll double check that. Take that home with me. 
is a funny old shell. You see the pattern? I keep finding really large chunks of shell down here. So we'll see what we've got when I've collected them all up. Take a look at this area. See all the pipes? Just wash up. We've got a hell of a lot of pipes. Nothing intact yet. We're just under, just under the surface there. You can see almost a bed of pipes. I've just picked up this clay pipe fragment, so it's a bit of the, there's a heel there, stem would go there, bowl there, bowl would come out here. The reason I'm going to keep it is because of the maker's marks. M, is that an anchor? Or is that an H? I'm not sure. And then it continues round. Um, I need to get a good look at this. It's a really interesting. And then it goes round again with a W. So it may just be M, W, and then on top here, that might be a, a logo. Oh, is it a key? Possibly a key. Anyway, I don't often find um, pipe bowls with these interesting or fragments of pipe bowls with these interesting markings on these makers marks so I'm going to keep this uh, as little a piece of history as it is it might turn into something massive so there we go I'm really pleased with that Here's a piece of Tudor green glaze. You can see the green glaze on there. There's a side view. And that looks to me like it was the base of something. That being the bottom. Or perhaps the lip. Ah, there we go. That looks like the lip of a vessel. Or is it that way? 15th, 16th century. Let's have a closer look at some of the pot shards I've been picking up today, as identification is not always as simple as it might first appear. All five pottery shards you see here have a green glaze. It's so easy to get these green glazed wares mixed up. For example, green glazed pieces are often referred to incorrectly as Tudor green pottery. It's become a bit of a catch-all term, but they could in fact be Surrey whiteware, borderware, mill green, or even slip-coated glazed earthenware. Sounds like a minefield right? It can be tricky, yes, as green, yellow and brown glazes were all commonly used during the medieval to post-medieval periods. Upon further inspection, and with the assistance of the ever-willing Richard Hemery, this pot shard here is not Tudor green, one of four types of medieval Surrey whiteware, but it is still Surrey whiteware, dating from 1350 to 1500. The reason it's been ruled out as Tudor green is due to its thickness. Now let's look at the other pieces of green glazed pottery I've picked up. This piece here is slip-coated glazed earthenware which dates from 1480 to 1600. Can you see the coating of white slip that's now visible underneath the green glaze? That's the telltale sign. Here we have a piece of Kingston whiteware, identifiable by the small sparse inclusions in the pottery fabric.
The other piece is a borderware, of which whiteware is a precursor. Termed borderware by archaeologist Clive Orton, as it was produced in potteries on the Hampshire Surrey border. For all this knowledge, I am indebted to Richard Henry and his brilliant book, Identifying the Pottery of the Thames Foreshore. It's available online in ebook form and is extremely affordable. So if you haven't already purchased a copy and are serious about getting to grips with pottery, please do. If you're ever wondering about how the foreshore can catch you out, check out left boot, check out right boot. I'm just crossing a notorious area where you're not actually allowed to stop and look as it's a scheduled monument. So I'm trying to pace it across so no one shouts at me and says, get off that area. And I've gone plumb into Oh. Anyway, we'll get that to dry out. That'll be an interesting journey home. So I've got over my mud drop, as it's going to be known, the mud drop episode. I'm over the other side, didn't get shouted at. Okay, notice something very pretty. Here it is. you're going to be used to things like this so before I tell you what it is a test for you what do you think this is ready that is a piece of pearlware 19th century 18th very late 18th 19th century Peeping out from under the incoming tide, I spotted this piece of Vestervald. Gorgeous cobalt blue. It's always a keeper to find some Vestervald. You can see the beading, the dotting there, or stippling. And there's a lovely leaf kind of decoration. This gorgeous cobalt blue colour. And this is stoneware. A large chunk of redware which has been glazed but I wanted to show you I'm not going to take this home I just wanted to show you that it, the base it's a larger than normal piece I usually find them in little slabs so there it is that's the bottom of some kind of redware vessel there we are I found this lovely piece of transfer ware. The perfect triangle. A witch's hat triangle. Guys, I found something incredibly special on the foreshore uh, in female form. Let me turn the camera around. Hang on one second. Here she is. It is Nicola White, Tideline Arts. Um, and what have you found today, Nicola? Well, apart from finding you. I know, a coincidentally. Which, which is a wonderful treat. Yes. Um, <laughs> I found a boar's tusk. Oh, lovely. Let's yeah. have a look at that. Look at that. A boar's um, tusk. Very nice. And have you, you, you have to, I had one of these and I let it go to ruin. So you've got to keep it in oil, I think. Yeah, um, have you got any good tips? No. To it? I, <laughs> no. Funnily enough, Mine I saw broke. Um, somebody on Instagram the, the other day was explaining how to do it. I think even coating them with some kind of varnish. Or something. Maybe. Don't quote me on that. I, I'll, I'll I look think, up what um, I read. I think, uh, <laughs> I think Alan, uh, yes, Alan Thames Larker had some tips, but uh, he found one recently that's got the middle bit intact, so he hasn't had to 
uh, put it in oil or anything. Yeah. Can I can I look, put it yeah, on my? Please do. Thank you. We're being very socially I distanced at one here. Point he was um, sitting on the table with an apple in his mouth. Oh yeah, maybe he was. Long time ago though. Long time ago. End of the 17th century, yeah. I think. When, so. When that was all the Rage, when it was all the rage. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're being very responsible here with our distance. <laughs> um, yeah, so I put mine in olive oil, which was not the thing to do. It split. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I, I'll, um, I'll look it up when I get home and I'll tell you later. Okay, well, there's Nicola. <laughs> Hi, guys. Great to see you. Oh. Here's one of the many drains that flows into the Thames. So while it's the cleanest it's been in the last 50, 60 years, we still do have waste water flowing into the Thames, especially after a storm. bones, animal bones on the foreshore. You can see splinters of them here. And they come from tanners, food places, chop houses, anything that uses animals, whether it's food, clothing, glue making, anything that uses animals with bones. When the bones are chucked out, they more often than not make their way down here onto the foreshore. And you often find pig bones, uh, cow bones, horse bones, the lot. So, and they tend to gather in weight and size. So if you just look down there, you can get an idea of just how many shards and splinters of bone here you go. And that's just one section. So, we used a hell of a lot of animals and still do. There you go. Bones and oyster shells. It's crazy, huh? Having spoken about bones, I guess I should address the question. Do we ever find human bones? Yes, we do. And a couple of my good mudlarking chums have found skulls, bones, all sorts. So um, have a look on the screen now for some links to their videos. got a little carabiner. More pieces of flagon that I wanted to show you, or some kind of vessel. There's the neck of it there. That piece. What else did I pick up? Some glazeware. Salt glaze, in fact. And a dark piece. So, three salt glaze wares there. And just to give you an impression of the kind of vessel this was, this is a piece of salt glazed stoneware and it looks like it would have been once part of a bellamine or actually to be correct, a Bartman jug nicknamed bellamine because of the Wild Man of the Woods character face that used to sit on the neck which had a resemblance to Cardinal Bellamine. Anyway, there we are, that's just to give you an idea.
here's a lovely piece, I don't know if you can spot it, fairly banged up in the middle. Transfer wear, 19th, 20th century. Lovely manganese, purple colour. Sweet little flower. I just wiped back the sound on this to find that lovely dendritic pattern that is tellingly mocha wear. Little piece there. And this glaze, these patterns are caused by reactions in the glaze when it's applied. guys I'm not sure if you can even see me it's so sunny down here um, thank you so much for watching we had such a fun day out today lots of ceramic stuff didn't find that bone that worked bone that I've been looking for for a while now who knows when that will turn up one day some lovely ceramics though some Westerwald tin glaze and also the catch of the day tie line art Nicola White I did not know she'd be down here so that was lovely to bump into her and have a look at the boar's tusk that she found. So all in all, a lovely day. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, I'd love it if you would. And uh, press that bell, all that kind of jazz. And thank you very much for watching. See you next time.